I have come for you. You right there. Every one of you remotely. You will soon join the Capuchin monks of the catacombs of Rome. The skeletons stacked on shelves, the shelves that read in Latin, as you are now, we once were, as we are now, you will soon be. For I am death and I come for everyone. Maybe you think you can evade me for a few minutes, few hours. Maybe you think you can play me a game of chess. <laughs> I let my chess.com account run out, so there's no chance of that. No, you're going to have to listen to me and listen to your future. <clears throat> anyway, uh, all right, let's start with some honesty. My name is not Death. My name is Debbie Downer. No, no, I'm kidding. My actual name is Dr. James Light. Dr. Light, thank you very much. I was a college professor. And uh, some of my students called me Dr. Jim. That's fine. And I used to explain how climate affects evolutionary biology. So that's a very different thing than you're used to hearing, but that was my expertise. So, let's see what I need to tell you. I, I am not Death, as I said. Death is very tough to schedule his timing. He always overbooks, so I'm here instead. And I will be trying to explain all these things to you very quickly. If I tell you you're going to die, your first response should be, well, duh. I mean, after all, everything dies, right? If you're over 11, then you've had goldfish or uh, gerbils or some other kind of pet, and you've seen it die. As for me, if you're going to die, I'm not going to kill you personally. If you fall dead after you watch this video, um, I'm in Brooklyn. I have an alibi. Brooklyn isn't usually my alibi, but in this case it would work. I'm not really Death. I'm more like Death has a Twitter feed, and I run the postings. Does that make sense? All right. We're also going to talk about COVID, because COVID has a very prominent part in Death. So are you following me so far? Very good. Very good. All right. And I'm going to actually have some extra entertainment here. You see, when I was a college professor, I found that people got very bored with me, you know. Sometimes they'd argue. I mean, I'm in an American classroom, of course. So if you are one of those who doesn't believe in evolution, for instance, or climate change, or even that COVID is dangerous. Um, you can't interrupt me because it's a videotape. Uh, I would suggest that you contact me via Yahoo or whatever your browser is, and I will send you the addresses for Amazon.com where you can buy your costuming and your camera equipment, and you can do your own damn play. Leave me out of it. I've had to explain this to freshmen far too often. Okay, so I did that, I did that. Uh, you probably wonder how I got to be an expert in such a boring field. I sometimes wonder that myself. Um, you know, I would explain to my students how, even though I wasn't a physicist, I'm not like Michael Mann, for instance, um, I do understand how climate interacts with biological creatures, which we are, of course, and how, even though physics isn't my specialty, uh, habitat is my specialty. So that's how I got my expertise. Are you following me so far? I don't want to get out too far ahead of you. Okay, 
and as time went on, I found that my students got very bored with me um, because I can be a boring person. <sighs> so I started doing my lectures dressed roughly like this. Uh, at least that would keep them awake for a while. And when that didn't even work, I started doing the clown business, you know. Mm. Put on something like this. Yeah, da, 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 da. See? I'm a clown. And I can tell you all kinds of jokes. And I can get your attention with this. Or we can uh, do this. Yeah, da, da. You're already more alert than you were when you came in, right? Okay, very good. Uh, we can also, I'll be talking about very scientific areas in a way that's accessible, I would say. So, for instance, let's talk balloon animals, right? Let's see if we have one. Ta -da. So, maybe we'll do balloon animals, right? Let's see a common British glowworm. I hate this part of the show. And... A common British glowworm. Now, I know what you're thinking. Um, uh, Dr. James, that doesn't look like a common British glowworm. And you know you're right. And my answer to you is, how do you know since they're extinct? And yes, common British glowworms are extinct. So it's just, it's just like seeing this. Okay, we'll be talking about extinction in a little while. Uh, in the meantime, see, I had to make my shows more interesting because I will be the first to admit I'm a very boring person. I feel sorry for the people who have to associate with me, and that especially includes my, uh, my family, which has no choice. They have to be friendly to me. You know how you know how every family has that one guy, the one guy you think of. Uh, he's the person in the family nobody really likes associating with. You know, you know who I'm talking about. He's the person who gets invited to the lesser family holidays like Easter or weddings of people you don't like. That guy. The guy who's always wearing weird political buttons all over his shirt, you know, bring back Brexit or, um, you know, stop breathing COVID, something like that. The person who comes to you to sign petitions to save the snail darter or some other obscure species. The person who looks like he's gotten his hair cut uh, by mail at Amazon.com, that guy. And, you know, all the parents tell their kids, please stay away from Uncle James, okay? So here's the sad part about all this. I'm not that guy. I'm the guy. The guy like that won't talk to because he thinks I'm nuts. And he might be right. You know, I'm talking about climate things, and I'm talking about the threat of human extinction and so forth. I wouldn't talk to me if I had a choice. Anyway, I'm going to be giving you a lot of information today. And some of it's going to be kind of uh, depressing. And I feel sorry for you. And I'm warning you right now, there are two kinds of people in the world I've discovered over my years. Um, group number one wants to know. If you have bad news, no matter how it is, bad, they want to know because they're planners and they plan things. So, for instance, if there is a shadow on the x-ray they take 
of their chest, even if it isn't a threat. If it is a threat, they want to know all the details as quickly as possible. They want to know if it's worth their while to go out and buy a huge tube of toothpaste because if they're not going to live till they use it all, then they will get the smaller one. Okay? That's one kind of people. Group number two are the people who absolutely don't want to know. Uh, that is the group I call Americans. <laughs> I know, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, the number two group really doesn't want to know. If they cannot control the outcome of things, they really don't want to know. Uh, they'll find out when they have to find out, when it's too late to do anything, that's okay. Uh, that's one of the things about COVID. People didn't want to know they were dying of COVID. Uh, in the United States, there were people who sent a nurse away if the nurse was saying something about COVID because she didn't have COVID. Anyway, the people in denial uh, about what they want to hear. Um, when I think of them, I think of the last field of study I had, which was yeast. I was studying yeast in the last years of the university, and it wasn't just because I had a rash. It was because yeast do quite well in not knowing anything. So for instance, um, if you take yeast and you pour them into a bottle with some a lot of water and some sugar and you keep the temperature just right and you put a cork in the bottle, the yeast could not be happier because they have food, they have an environment they like, they're able to have yeast sex. If you know how yeast have sex, please let me know. I don't think they do, but that's another story. Anyway, so they breed like crazy, and they have plenty of food, and everything's going fine for them in their little bottle, and then they run out of food, and they drown in their own urine. And just to keep things dark, they drown in their own urine, which is how we have champagne. So it, I respect completely your desire to live like yeast. I kind of wish I could have done it if I'd known earlier what we were going through. So if you decide this is not your cup of tea, and you're with a group of your friends, you go out. Uh, I don't know if your bars are still open, but they are in the United States, some places. And drink yourself for about 30 minutes, and then you can come back and you can be with your friends, who by that time will need you to drink with them. All right? Okay, so... So, there you go. We have now picked the people who are going to stay and the people who are going to go. All right, the first part of this is going to be that um, you probably want to know why I got involved in this in the first place. Well, I came of age at a time when the Club of Rome was saying we were doomed, and Dr. Paul Ehrlich, the man who wrote the book The Population Bomb, said we were doomed. And so naturally, I'm in high school trying to decide a career path, and I said, well, doom's a career path. So there you go. And there we were, learning about all of these things that were going to happen. And that also affected one of the major decisions in my life, which was I decided not to have children. And that did not make my mom happy. My mom was a really nice person, but she expected to be a grandmother. And I had to explain to her that I didn't think it was a responsible thing to bring grandchildren onto the earth. And so we didn't really make peace about that until, well, really when she went into hospice. And we'll talk about that in a little while, too. So anyway, Arr, arr. 
Are you frightened? <laughs> well, you would be if you're Canadian because this is actually a hockey stick. I tried to um, get a scythe when I was traveling doing this show on the road. And I found out that British Airways and a number of other carriers will not let you bring a scythe on this standalone uh, luggage. So I brought this instead, which is a hockey stick, and you can't really hurt anybody with it. But it's very useful uh, because a hockey stick is how we tell what's going on. Don't you get it? So um, if you look at somebody named Michael Mann, his book was called The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars. This is how you tell that we're in trouble. So you take the hockey stick and you say that this end is the past and we're right about here, which is the present where we've already set off a bunch of things that are going to go wrong. Is everybody following me? Good. Okay, so the Earth is 4.3 billion years old. Humans have really not been here that long. Uh, hominids got here about 4.4 million years. We're going to be using a lot of big numbers here. So there's millions and billions and even a few trillions. So we're just going to call them all illions. And that'll make it easier to follow. We're also going to have agas and igas. So is that agatons of methane? No, it's agatons of methane. But it will be igatons by the time we all go extinct. Hello. Is, so this is going to use instead of my laptop. So it's not a laptop. It's an actual scientific instrument. And reality goes left to right, your left and then your right. Um, something like that. And it tells you history. So human beings have been around for about 40 feet or 8 meters. Um, the stick, depending on whether or not you're American or communist. <laughs> I'm kidding, okay? So, uh, and this is where we are now various places. So um, we started burning fossil fuels at at scale after the Industrial Revolution, which is somewhere around here. 1750 was the year it started. And because of that, we put two trillion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that is a greenhouse gas. And then that has has led to almost two degrees centigrade increase in global average temperature. Okay, and meanwhile, because of all the great things that carbon fuels do for us, all those great things that uh, fossil fuels do, we've increased our population. So we had one billion billion with a B. Uh, we're going to use billions a lot, so I'm just going to call them aliens. So we had an alien with a B, humans here, and then we added uh, two alien with a TR uh, tons of CO2 to the atmosphere up till now, and that in turn has fed greenhouse gas emissions. And so now, we are much warmer, and it also affected populations. So as I said, uh, one billion with a B, human beings, right around here. And then we just took off, and now we've got 7.8 billion with a B, human beings, which is probably more than we can sustain. OK, and because this is a magic hockey stick, it's also Etch a sketch so you can forget all that and you can realize that we're far away. Now, the last time we had this much carbon in the atmosphere 
ocean levels were 25 meters higher. Uh, animals bigger than a shrew could not bioregulate. That meant they basically they died of heat stroke. And uh, the plants that human beings now depend on to live, I mean, things like, oh, I don't know, uh, corn and wheat, all of those things are now um, going to have trouble propagating at temperatures higher than 2C, which is a temperature we're going to go to. Okay, got that? All right, now, let's, for those of you who don't know meters, so how much is 25 meters is it, uh, of ocean time? So is it this high or is it this high? Or is it, uh, I'll get in trouble if I poke this through the ceiling, but you get the idea. We're going to have a lot of water. We're going to have a lot of water, but we're not going to have a lot of food. Anyway. Oh, yeah, we, we have another balloon out of Yeah. This. Is a white rhino. Again, uh, well, I drew one on it, but it fell off. Um, white rhinos have started going extinct. All rhinos um, are going extinct. Animals are losing their habitat, so white rhinos eat a bunch of things that are not able to grow in weather like this. So the next part is probably something you don't know very much because it's not a subject they talk about on the news channels. What you don't know is about a very important chemical reaction. And I'm not talking about hydrogen cars or electronic vehicles or anything. I am talking about methane. Now, what is Methane. Well, I'll show you. It's an odorless, clear substance. Isn't very large. It is actually a fossil fuel. And it's an odorless, colorless substance. And there happens to be two trillion tons of it sequestered under the Arctic ice. Now, ordinarily, it wouldn't mean anything. I mean, methane is, after all, a poisonous gas. Although, we're also separated from each other, and besides which, uh, this is not methane. This is an odorless, colorless liquid substance called metaphor. Okay? So, it's not going to do you any harm even if we were in the same room. But real methane is sitting two trillion tons worth, I'm sorry, billion with a TR, under the Laptev Sea and other Arctic shelves. And it's all sitting there because the water is nice and cold and there's a great deal of pressure. And so it's all kept there. However, uh, as the oceans around the North Pole get warmer, the methane starts to seep out and escape. A scientist named Natalia Shakova, no, I can't spell it for you, you have to look it up, has said that we are facing the possibility of 50 billion tons of methane escaping at that some point because the water has gotten so warm. That's not good. Because when the methane gets out, it's a hundred times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2 in the short term. In you know, a couple of years, it eventually dissolves down to CO2. But for a while, it's very warm. We could be at the planetary equivalent of Venus if there was a massive release of methane. 
And even without that, you already see the animals suffering as a result of all the methane going out. We actually have a guest, and I'll introduce our guest momentarily, who will explain to you about methane. And so, we're talking about extinction of animals. We have an actual guest to talk about extinction who has first-hand knowledge of what we're doing in the Arctic. Say hello to Beery, the polar bear. Hello. Hello, Beery. Hello. Yes, I was very hungry. I thought I was going to starve. But fortunately, I found a baby polar bear, and so I ate it. Because right now, that's all the food that's left. Ah, talk to me about methane. Methane bubbles everywhere. It's wiping out all the places we used to be able to stand on the ice and hunt. And now, we swim. And as we swim, we go hungry. Going... I'm going back home. Don't you understand? If I stay out in the wild... If I stay out in the wild, I'm gonna starve. But if I come here, I'm facing functional extinction. That's a big name. Functional extinction. That's what's happening to my friends, the koalas. The koalas used to be able to live anywhere they wanted. <coughs> but the fires killed all of the eucalyptus trees, so now they have to live in zoos. And once you live in a zoo, you're functionally extinct. You'll never be able to live in the wild again. That's the problem. And you people don't understand this. You don't understand that if my habitat disappears, I'm gone. They're gone. You can probably genetically engineer us, but that's not going to work. Let's see. So, I'm getting back on the plane now. I'll see you later. Say bye to everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, that means I'm leaving. You can take your fist out of my butt. All right, it's fine. <sighs> so, methane. Methane continues to be released in huge quantities. Methane is a hundred times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. So, in the short term at least, it will raise Earth temperatures very quickly. So that's the bad news we're all facing. Now, um, I know people find this very hard to believe. And I've, when I was traveling and doing my show, people would confront me. They were religious people. They would say, I don't believe that God will not protect us from temperatures that will kill us. I do have one religious statement that I make to such people. I say, look, assume that God runs everything. And God is looking at what we're doing. Do you think if God comes back, he's going to be happy with what we've done to the planet? You know, I think he's going to be rather pissed. 
In fact, uh, those of you in my audience who went to college for theater might remember a phrase called deus ex machina. There, that's where God comes in and fixes everything magically. And I don't think that's going to be possible. Uh, I don't know that God even has a machina big enough to fix all the damage we've done since we invented the Industrial Revolution. So there's that. Now, there are other opinions, of course, on how these things work. One of the things that people want to deny me about the likelihood of near-term extinction is they bring up little green men. You know what I'm talking about, the, the creatures that are supposedly out in space ready to jump in and help us as soon as we have a problem. <clears throat> I hate to tell you, but I don't think they're out there. Um, the likelihood of them being out there and being willing to help us is pretty short. If there are any people in the audience here who remember, there was a man named Enrico Fermi who worked on the Manhattan Project, and he obsessed in the 50s and 60s saying, if there are billions and billions and billions of stars out there, and they've been there for 14 billion years, why have we not been greeted by any of them. Surely, out of billions and billions, some of them would have figured out how to get off their own planet and might have even found us. Think about it. We've been sending out signals since the Titanic sent the first SOS back in 1912. So they know there's somebody there. If they have super radar, they should know that we're out here. So why haven't they come by to visit? Okay, this is my best guess. Uh, it was kind of what Enrico Fermi was trying to do. Uh, number one possibility, we just are calling it a bad time. You know, there's a family wedding, uh, somebody had a flood, they might have had their own version of COVID and they're not interested in contacting people. Possibility number two is <clears throat> they've seen what our culture is like and they've decided they could put that off a few more years. I mean, after all, if they're getting stuff from the 1950s, that means they're looking at lots of episodes of I Love Lucy. Maybe they've decided they don't want to talk to us yet. You know, life has better things to offer. Possibility number three, of course, is that... They are not capable of dealing with the problems in getting here. Uh, possibility number four, I'm not a religious person, but the Roman Catholic Church says that we're the only life form here. We're the only intelligent life form here. Domini, Domini, checkers, checkers. And nobody else is out there, so no matter how much contact we send out, nobody's going to answer us. All right, those are all very good reasons, but Fermi and then later scientists like Carl Sagan and Michio Kaku and a host of others came to the conclusion that the reason we aren't hearing from anybody else is that civilizations don't survive intelligence. Think about it. Uh, we were, what? 10 minutes away from blowing up the world during the missiles of October in 1962. Well, <clears throat> maybe all those millions and billions and billions of civilizations didn't get lucky the way we did. Yeah. But now, I hear you thinking, I know there are people in this audience who are thinking, but we have technology, man. We can do things, man. All right, so here are the technology things we would have to surmount to keep from going extinct in the very near future. 
you'd have to figure out how to make sure the ice doesn't melt. That's going to be very hard considering there's all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we haven't had since the Pliocene era. Okay? There's also all the things that are happening on the ground itself. You know, we don't have to kill all the tardigrades. We just have to kill all the food the tardigrades need to eat. And then the tardigrades go away. And the one issue I haven't brought up lately in this group, because you seem like nice people, is let's say something happened tomorrow with COVID or some other rapidly transmitting viral disease that could kill us in an instant. Okay, if all the humans went away, or a significant number of humans went away, do you hear that? I'm going to pretend I didn't. Even if all of the humans went away, there are 454 or 455, depending on who you ask, nuclear power reactors on Earth, all of which need to have constant cool water running through them where they will melt down and they will send out enough ionizing radiation to kill all of us. It takes 60 years to decommission a nuclear reactor. So, unless we get really clever about this, yeah, we're doomed. So, this is what you waited for, right? This was the thing that I was going to tell you because, well, the bad news is that at the rate of heating we're seeing right now, and with the challenges we have facing us, we could all be extinct as early as 2030. You don't have to believe me for that. You can just listen to the scientists. Um, there's always Guy McPherson or a number of other scientists, and all they do is they compile the information and it all looks bad. So I will tell you now that um, absent a miracle, absent something we don't even understand how it could happen, uh, very lucky to go through to 2030 without humans going extinct. It might be as soon as 2026. And when I try to explain this to people, it's not that we don't care. It's not that we aren't trying. Absent someone inventing a time machine, for instance, that can save us. We lose the Arctic ice and the temperature goes into runaway global warming and we go to 5 or 10 C above current levels and we're gone. And this is the thing I try to explain to people. Uh, we're at the end. And if we're at the end, what do you want to do about it? See, I don't have an answer. And when I tried to tell people what was coming, they didn't listen. Uh, this is where I'm broadcasting from. I tried to get you an idea that maybe we were in some little catacomb somewhere, but no. Yeah. This is my little room. I'm renting it from a friend. This is where I live. My bed's over here. I have no money. 
which I didn't expect, uh, but this is where I find myself in the end. So what do I want people to do? So now what we do is we rely on what we call hope. We call it hopium. Uh, the idea that you're going to suddenly change the world by wishing on a star. The bad news about wishing on a star, as my astronomer friends remind me, is that you're looking at a star as it was 8 million light years ago. Which means when you wish upon that star, that star is dead. So are your dreams. Meanwhile, people are making bets about whether or not I'm going to kill myself, whether any of our little circle are going to kill ourselves. And, uh, no, 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 you know. I like to think that if you drown yourself in a bathtub, for instance, that's half full of water, doesn't that make you an optimist? These things puzzle me when I wake up at night. And I think to myself, you know, I could still have my university job if I'd get my big mouth shut. And I didn't. I decided telling people the truth was a big deal. It's, it's not a pleasant thing to do. Ask Galileo, for God's sake. Ask Copernicus. When you know what's going on, and it's bad news, nobody wants to listen to you. I mean, after all, I could have kept my job, but I didn't. I decided to tell people what was going on. And why did I do that? Why did I decide people should know? Well, you saw the earlier part of my show, and here's the thing. You, all of you, you are not yeast. You have a mind, and you have the capacity to love and to care for others, and others care for you as well. And all those things sort of pile up. We get obsessed with money these days, but money isn't the answer. I wanted to refer back. Um, as I said, my mother was very upset that I decided not to bring children into the world, and we never really made our peace about that. But one morning about a year ago, she went for her appointment and they found some shadows where there shouldn't be shadows on her x-rays. And so she went into hospice. Have any of you been through hospice? Anybody here? Show of hands. I know I can't see you, but pretend you can. So hospice is really kind of amazing. You know, we don't understand until the very end just how little importance there is to a material world. Because if you're in hospice, you know, you don't have to have all the coins on the table. You can walk away without the flush. And what we're facing right now in terms of an end of the world, doesn't that kind of trump everything else? Sorry to use the phrase trump. Cultural lands. You get the idea. So when we know everything's going away, what do we want to do about it? I would like to propose that we live a life of hospice. We live as if our whole planet was hospice. Because funny as the idea is of planet fuck it, 
And yeah, it makes me angry every morning when I get up that this is one more day I won't have again. But we need to show our love to each other. We need to take some chances. I'm a big fan of the Buddhists and the idea of right action. You know, maybe we think, maybe we know that we can't save the planet, but that doesn't mean we're not obligated to try. Fury, did you hear the good news? The humans are going to start behaving themselves. Beer? Oh. Um, I'm no zoologist, but it looks like uh, Barry decided to fight on loss. And this is on us. So I have to ask you to live your life with generosity. Um, if you want to do something really useful for the planet, um, throw some random seeds around. They don't have to be marijuana. Um, they might be something else. But do something to replant the earth. Maybe we can squeeze out a few more weeks or months. Maybe this isn't him, but I, I don't want to encourage you to behave as if it is him. Because if you don't believe, if you don't believe in a plant hospice, the only other thing you can believe in is on it, fuck it. <laughs>